Roman emperors were praised for how diligently and fairly they judged legal cases. The Emperor Augustus was praised for presiding over court well into the night, and the Emperor Claudius was praised for his wise judgments. Vespasian was also praised for addressing the backlog of cases that built up during the Civil War that made him emperor. Emperors, of course, were also blamed for their poor decisions. Tiberius was considered cruel for punishing too many people with death, and Claudius was faulted for his hasty judgments or behaving unconventionally when he revised the list of jurors. During the late Republic and Imperial periods, trials could happen before a jury or before a magistrate, such as the emperor. Justice and fairness were seen as ideals for the Senate and emperor to uphold, but these ideals are understood differently today from how they were understood within the Roman Empire. The biographer Suetonius says that one wealthy man was so frustrated that prostitutes could be used as witnesses against him in a case about abusing women that he threw writing tablets and a stylus into the Emperor Claudius's face, cutting him. Suetonius also tells us that the Emperor Caligula was wrong to make men pay harsher penalties than their social status deserved. These two observations show that justice could be miscarried if the judge followed the wrong procedures or if the judge provided the wrong sentence. They also show that the proper sentence was not only based on the crime, but also on the social status of the guilty person. A person's social status depended on their wealth, social connections, and legal status. Legally, people could be slaves, Roman citizens, Latin citizens with fewer rights than Roman citizens, or foreigners with yet another set of fewer rights. Enslaved people obviously had very few rights. Women also had few rights. They at least formally needed their legal actions approved by a guardian. Starting in the reign of Augustus, if they had three or more children, they could apply to be freed from this guardian's oversight. Women could also not hold political office, and they usually were barred from speaking at political assemblies. Freedmen were Roman citizens, but they too could not hold political office and were socially looked down upon. At the top of the social and legal hierarchy were the Roman emperors, senators, equestrians, who are sometimes called knights, but were really not cavalry in the sense of medieval knights, and decurions, or local town councilmen. It was expected that certain punishments, like crucifixion, would be reserved for slaves, and that the upper classes would be spared the harshest penalties. The expectation was formalized in the 2nd century AD with the distinction between honestiores, or more upright people, and humiliores, or more lowly people. So, what are some of the penalties that someone could face in ancient Rome? I should warn you before we look at them that Romans were far more comfortable with violence and brutality than most of us are, so these might feel a bit graphic. People found guilty may have to pay a fine, be demoted in legal and therefore also in social status, be banished to an island, forced to provide manual labor on public projects for a specified time, or condemned to work in the mines for the rest of his life, exiled from Rome, or be executed. Possible execution methods involve decapitation, crucifixion, being burned alive, being killed by animals in the arena, or being forced to serve as untrained gladiators or hunters in the arena. Flogging with whips, branding, and torture were generally reserved for punishing slaves, but free Romans could be beaten with rods. Ideally, the punishment would fit the crime so that there was the proper amount of retribution, humiliation, and deterrence of future crime. These examples of crimes and their prescribed punishments all come from the Sententiae Pauli, a compilation of legal thoughts and opinions written in Africa around 300 CE and mistakenly attributed to a jurist named Paulus. Physical injury, whether it's through damaging people's reputation with insulting poems, or physically harming them with broken limbs and bones, 
can be punishable by a reduction in legal status, exile, work in the mines or on public works, or death. Stealing domesticated animals, and here the author carefully defines the crime by how many animals were stolen, has multiple penalties. A guilty person should pay some multiple of the animal's value and or suffer some punishment based on his rank, being beaten with rods, labor on public works for a year, or being re-enslaved. There are further punishments prescribed for consulting an astrologer about the health of the emperor, for practicing witchcraft, for rebellion, for murder, for various types of sacrilege, for forgery, and for false testimony, among other things. At first sight, the reasons for the specific punishments for each person for crime may not always make much sense. To understand the logic behind why people could be punished in certain ways, let's look at the punishment proposed for arson. If you commit arson, there are a few possible punishments. If you're an arson of lower social rank, and you do it out of personal hatred, you could be sent to the mines or sentenced to public labor. If you're of higher rank and your arson was out of hatred, you could be deported to an island. If you committed arson so that you could plunder the town, you were sentenced to death. Lower classes suffered more than upper classes. Long-term manual labor is seen as worse than just being banished to an island. There was further reason for the punishments. Manual labor was seen as more suited to the slaves and lower classes than to the wealthy, so they had to do manual labor that would be suffering, so work in the mines was worse, so it was likely the punishment for slaves instead of free people of low social standing. If you are wealthy, deportation to an island removed you from public life, where the wealthy were supposed to compete against one another for political gain or for economic benefits. But what about arson for the sake of plunder? The legal scholar thinks everyone should be executed for that. In a way, burning and taking plunder is an act of war and rebellion. The same scholar says that people stirring up a rebellion or riot should be crucified, killed by beasts in the arena, or deported to an island. Burning something down to steal is a bit more than turning against your community or theft. It was also away from taking from it, so it deserves a greater punishment, death. Executions, and in fact most Roman punishments, were a form of spectacle. People enjoyed watching trials and shouted commentary at the participants. People grew noticeably poorer if they were fined, or they were noticeably absent if they were sent to the mines, an island, or into exile. In fact, when Cicero was briefly exiled, his house was torn down and replaced with a shrine to the goddess Liberty. People's scars from being branded or flogged would be visible, and they might be seen working around town if they were condemned to work on the public works. If an emperor or an imperial family member were punished by having their memory erased, inscriptions would still show their name carved away. Roman executions were also often meant to be seen. If a Roman suffered demnatio ad bestias, or were thrown to the beasts, it happened in the arena during the public games. The entire population, or at least an embodiment of the Roman citizen body, was seated around the arena based on status. The emperor, senators, and equestrians in front, free men behind them, women further back, and enslaved people in the back. If these mosaics from Africa represent reality and not just an ideal, the guilty were dressed as barbarians and restrained. This visually removed the convicts from the Togate citizen body and made them powerless as animals tore into their flesh. During the imperial period, Romans could even stage myths to execute convicts and prisoners of war at public spectacles. In myth, the hero Hercules becomes a god after burning himself live on his funeral pyre. The Christian Tertullian suggests the Romans convict or burned a convict alive to reenact this myth. In another myth, Icarus does not listen to his father 
Daedalus' advice about how to fly with homemade wings. Instead of flying a middle course between the waves and sun, Icarus flew too high. The wax on his wings melted, and he crashed into the waves and died. In the reenactment, the convict seems to have crashed too soon, so close to Nero's box at the games that the emperor was spattered with the man's blood. As a final brutal example, let's look at crucifixion, a type of punishment that was made famous by Jesus and the survivors of the Spartacus slave rebellion. The convict was attached to a cross outside the city walls along a highway. Convicts were often tied naked to a cross and left to die, but their deaths could be sped up by nailing them to the cross or breaking their legs. The bodies were then left on the cross to rot and be food for animals, a great insult in the ancient Mediterranean world. In fact, their bodies were usually prevented from receiving funeral rites as a further punishment. The location outside the city walls signified the convict's exclusion from the citizen body as if they were enemies of Rome, and it put their death on display on major roads and highways. The brutality of this punishment meant that it was often reserved for the enslaved, robbers, pirates, insurrectionists, and rebels. In a way, the Romans viewed all of these people as at war with Rome. Slaves were considered prisoners of war, and the others fought against Roman order.